Is this my true identity? Non-dual traditions, it's basically called inquiry. Uh, it's a path of inquiry, and, it, and the inquiry is a way of, of getting underneath the underlying assumptions. It's kind of like, um, if you have an assumption, and we'll call it even an unquestioned assumption, that then turns, it's like it crystallizes and it turns into a subconscious belief. That's really a good definition of, of a subconscious belief, is an unquestioned assumption. And when we say unquestioned, it, it's, like, it's like the mind is too afraid to even raise it up into awareness to question it. It's, it's like something that, that is acted upon and acted out upon because it's just to, so sacred to the mind. And so, I would say in my life, you know, there were different parts of the Course that jumped out at me initially, but, but something that I was doing before I came to the Course that just was, you know, accentuated in the Course was to learn this course requires that you question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden or it will obscure your learning. And there was a time, maybe within the past year or so, where somebody said, was there any key, was there any key phrase or key, is there any key ingredient or anything that you found was like your secret in awakening or anything like that? But but it was that phrase that just jumped at me, because I would say it just gave me more uh, permission and allowance to continue on with what I was doing already. Because when I was in graduate school, uh, I was just questioning everything. I would, I would even have uh, graduate assistants around me, and after they'd talk with me for like 15 minutes, they'd say, would you just stop that? It's just awful. He's just questioning everything. And, and then they were, I would usually listen to him and I'd say, well, what, what do you suggest? And, and they would say, get a life. Man, get a life. <laughs> like, you are wasting your time and spinning your wheels. And I would say, well, you know, what do you mean by life? And they would say, you know, get a relationship, get in debt, uh, get a job, uh, you know. And then I said, yeah, and what? you know, grow old, get sick and die. And they say, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the gig here. And it, it's been the gig for thousands of years, so if you're here on planet Earth, yeah, that's the gig. So get with the program, you know. Get with, and I just say, absolutely unacceptable. Absolutely. If that's, if that's the gig, I don't care if this is the gig on this planet, but that is, there's just no way. What, that's not a thing to devote a life to. And I felt like I was just questioning in a very authentic way. Like, I just didn't want to accept something just because someone said it. Or even, you know, because someone famous said it, you know. They say, oh, so-and-so said it, and they give the name, and it's just, that's supposed to mean, oh, well, you better <laughs> accept this one. And I would question and question. There's always a great admirer of uh, Krishnamurti. Uh, I just felt such my heart exploding with love when I would watch uh, some of his talks or listen to some of his talks or read his books. I would just be like, wow. I, I would just have a big smile on my face because he was big on inquiry and questioning. In fact, just volumes of it for decades. You know, it's got to be the, the Guinness World Book of Record for inquiry. <laughs> you know, it's like, Wow! Spectacular! And that's what I was doing. And then, most people were, were quite put off by that. Parents, girlfriends, teaching assistants, professors, if I dare <laughs> begin such a thing with my professors. It wasn't popular at all. And eventually then, I, the course came into my life and I went to the woods, kind of like a combination between Henry David Thoreau and Robinson Crusoe to live in the woods and catch rainwater and read my course and, you know, have some organic gardens and grow some food and, and basically do some meditation as much as I could.
But I still had to, I basically, it was the path of inquiry and contemplation. There was too much resistance for me to meditate. Just the monkey mind was just going crazy. The more I simplified my life, the more the monkey mind went crazy. And then I would, you know, I would like simplify my diet. I decided to go with the Thoreau diet of, of bread and water. And Thoreau actually decided to experiment to find the, the most efficient, easiest form of bread that he could come up with. And I, I decided to do the same test. And yes, the pancake one uh, always wins. And, and so that was the kind of thing you know, where I was having bread and water, bread and pancakes. And then one day I went out, I, I kind of like, I was like in Eric's phase, I was just totally letting it all go, letting it all go. And one day I went out to like a Walmart, and I just walked down the aisles, and the ego of me just rose up, just, just looking at all the, the things that would satisfy it. And, you know, it was just a great experiment to walk through Walmart when you're in one of those renunciation phases. You know, like, almost like a tease, it was a tease to go through it. But, but eventually I just came back to the inquiry. So, to me, getting down to that decision point and getting deep down in the mind, you know, towards the escape hatch, it really did seem to be a lot of contemplation and inquiry. It wasn't, I didn't really necessarily use like, like uh, with Ramana Maharshi, you know, who is the I. I just wasn't at the place, you know, as your girlfriend is screaming at you, you know, you just, you know, who is the I that's upset, you know, it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know you. you know, it just doesn't, it didn't seem to have, touch on, on where I was at in, in awareness. But I did tune into the Holy Spirit after about two and a half years of immersing in the Course, and then the Holy Spirit, Jesus, would guide me with the questions. It would be like a dialogue, like, they would say, are you ready to question the belief in career? And I was, I was actually at the point, so I said, okay, I, I still have needs, money doesn't grow on trees, you know, I, I still, I feel like I'm still going to have to work, and I talk to Jesus about all these things, and he'd say, but are you willing to let go of the idea of career? In other words, are you willing to let me instruct you about the next job? instead of trying to put it like as a, in a crown jewel of this leads to this, leads to that, leads to that. And I was, I was actually at that point when that was a big step for me. I wasn't ready to just believe that I could materialize uh, money in my backyard or something like that. I, I told him, no, I can't go that far, but I, I am willing to question the, the belief in career. And that was helpful, because I had a lot of strain and stress. When, when you're you know, seemingly in this culture, in the United States, and male, and in your 20s, late 20s, career is actually a pretty prominent uh, belief. You know, it's a pretty strong one. And so, Jesus worked with me step by step to say, let's just take a look at this one. And it would be more like we would whittle away at it a bit, you know. We didn't, I, we didn't start with questioning the whole idea of linear time. But once I got into the Course, I could tell that those workbook lessons were aimed at questioning all of my time ideas too. Everything that I believed about time. And then everything that laid on the surface that was resting on linear time. If you take linear time out of the equation, the whole thing collapses. I mean, you, you couldn't talk about any topic in a meaningful way without that underlying belief in linear time. So that's the jugular. And Jesus talked to Helen Shuckman, who was a psychologist as well, and said, you never go for the jugular. You know, you, you don't work with patients and go for the jugular. They come, they feel a warm welcome, they feel a connection, rapport. You say, what are you feeling? You know, what would you like to talk about today? They give you the presenting problem. It's about the perceptual world, you know husband, or a partner, or a child, or, or some financial issue, or health issue they've got, and then gently the Spirit takes it down, and in my case it was through inquiry. So I feel like uh, A Course in Miracles is a really good 
path of inquiry. It's very, it's a system, it's guided, um, it's, it's very uh, all-inclusive. I, I really didn't feel like I had to add to the course, like, and look for the missing piece, or looking for a better course, or the next evolution of the course. I didn't have that feeling when I was reading the course. I thought, this is like a complete system here, and I can give myself fully to this, and I need not try to to pull in a lot of other things. I've been doing that, by the way, anyway, <laughs> uh, for quite a few years. So it was quite actually a relief to feel that feeling like you know you can you can dive in here. You don't need to keep skimming across the surface of and taking a stab here and there and trying to come up with like some kind of synthetic philosophy or synthetic religion, you know. I think that I had a bit of that going on earlier. I was like looking for the synthetic blend. Take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and just mix it together in a test tube and have my own individual David's special blend. And it was like, no, but David's the problem. <laughs> David, David's special blend is not going to get you out of, of this world. You're going to have to have more, more humbleness, more humility than that. So that was really, it. In, a, in a nutshell, the inquiry, I think, takes us back to that decision point of escape. Yeah, that's really true. The Course does give us the inquiries, gives us the inquiries to ask. Yeah, it does. It's just there. You, and you recognize it, too. I guess that's the biggest problem with trying to do inquiry without any sense of like structured guidance is it just seems too much hit or miss, way too overwhelming, um, almost like, oh, what a mess, what a tangled mess, you know, what, tang what tangled webs we weave when first we practice to deceive. It, it's so tangled that, that, that you, you feel that it's almost like something that you're called to, but it almost just seems too overwhelming. But with the Course, it's, it's, systematic, it's all laid out for you, it's like a roadmap, just follow the steps, here, go here next, here next, and, you know, it's, it's just so, so precious, I mean, I, I feel like, um, it's, you can't have a better roadmap than from one who has already taken the journey, and, and come to the destination, uh, whereas everything else, a lot of times seem more like speculation. This seemed more like, ah, I hit the, I hit the gold mine. I followed some of the nuggets in other books that led me to the course, and then when I opened the course up, that was the instant feeling like, okay, Peter, we've, we've just hit the gold mine, and, and then the, the very next feeling was like, okay, now it's on me. I can't really say to God, you just, you know, you never really made it clear enough, you know, you just <laughs> never, it was just always wishy-washy, you were always hidden clues, and, you know, and having to dig so hard and everything. This was like, oh, oh I guess I gotta practice this now, because now I don't have any excuses. Uh, it's, you know, I could recognize it as my way out. And then I had to practice it. But that was good.